right, so the purpose of today is to review that calculation in the electrolytic cell where we figured out how many grams of the metal that is plated or collected at the cathode. Um, and it has really some important concepts that we kind of went forward and we're gonna go backwards and forward. I wanted to do this calculation, but there's some things that I wanna go back a little bit to explain for you. We, you did that last night, and so I wanna walk you through the backside of that worksheet that you guys watched and follow along with me last night on that video. So let's, before we get to that calculation and, and to talk about, let's talk about Faraday's laws of electrolysis. Michael Faraday was a, uh, one of the most important um, uh, scientists of his day. It's, we're talking now early 1800s. So this is during the time we're figuring out what electricity is. We still don't know about atoms although people were thinking that there were these, were these little particles. We don't know what electrons are, okay? We do know that there's positive attracting negatives. And so Michael Faraday, among many things, he was a very important experimentalist, so important in this, in this time period that Albert Einstein, you know him very well, he actually had a picture of Michael Faraday in his, um, in his desk. I don't know what kind of man crush he had, but he thought he was so important that he had a picture of Michael Faraday. So I don't know if that changes your thinking of Einstein or not, but he had a man crush on Michael Faraday to show that how, uh, how important Einstein was uh, in his uh, work in the early 1900s. Well, he was thinking that Michael Faraday was just as important, okay? Also, I think uh, Einstein had a picture of Sir Isaac Newton, the, the individual that had the first laws of motion that actually Einstein corrected, okay? And uh, Maxwell, okay? But in any case, um, what were the laws? So Michael Faraday was working with electricity, magnetism, um, and um, although he didn't unify like Maxwell did, he was the first to start working with a battery, the 1800s early. Um, don't know if it was a voltaic pile or not, but he took a battery and he was doing electro electrolysis. He was taking salts, okay, that we all know are just positive and negative ions sticking together. I don't know where my model went, okay. Maybe it's working today and get to on, a, on a shoot, but or my model, oh, there it is. Okay, so uh, we're talking about a salt, an ion attracted to a negative in a crystal pattern. Okay, we take this and we melt it into the individual ions. Okay, and from there, you got your positive ions and your negative ions. You put in two electrodes and you make one hit a one electrode to the battery to the other. If this is the negative part of the battery, which you know is the anode, it makes this one the negative cathode. If this one's the positive, the cathode of the battery, this of course makes the anode positive. Electrons always flow from anode to cathode. And so we know, just by logic, the positive ions come running, okay? And those positive ions are usually metals. For instance, if it's iron plus two, it's gonna gain two electrons to become iron zero, which we now know is a solid and elemental state of iron. And we would collect that iron here. So this was, not, this was done in the early 1800s, and, the, and, and Michael Faraday was investigating. In fact, he had two laws, okay, that he developed. The first law was that there was a seeming ratio, there was some kind of parallel or some proportion to the grams collected and the amount of current. Meaning, if there was more current going through the wire, there was gonna be more grams. If he doubled the current, there was double the grams of whatever metal he was collecting at the cathode. Now, um, let's think about this a little more, okay? And I'm not really fond of this this, there we go, that's the guy I wanted, there we go. So we should know at this point, we have voltage. Voltage, we should know, is joule per coulomb. It's the energy, energy is measured in joule, that can push the charge. Coulomb's law is about the charge. Now, of course, the charge that we're dealing with here is due to electrons. They're negatively charged. So this charge is always about electrons in our electrochemical cells. So hey, the voltage is the energy that pushes or pulls electrons through the uh, circuit, 
Okay, so we know that. And we know that this voltage speaks to spontaneity because if the chemicals involved, the one oxidizing and the one reducing, can collectively create a pathway for electrons to go to anode to cathode in a battery, we know it works, it's spontaneous. Okay, if the chemicals are not good at pushing, oxidizing, or pulling, reducing, it's non-spontaneous, but batteries are set up to give us free energy. So we know that we can add those two chemicals together, we get E0 cell, electromotor force is another word, net potentials we've used. So voltage is the energy, but it's based upon how well the individual components of a battery can oxidize and reduce. All right, now what about amperage? We've talked about this. Amperage is not voltage, it's not an energy. Amperage, and this is where you saw from last night's homework, sometimes equal to impulse, okay, is the coulomb of charge that runs through a circuit over some time period, a second. So it's the coulombs per second. The analogy I used, um, the analogy I used earlier uh, in a course a couple weeks ago was the voltage is like the height of the waterfall. There's tremendous potential for water to crash down with tremendous energy the higher the waterfall. Sometimes they call voltage a potential difference because of that. All right, the amperage, so the voltage is actually the height. So the height is equal to the voltage in terms of this analogy of our um, water crashing in a waterfall, okay? But the amperage is the actual water that flows. You can have a tremendously high waterfall, but in a drought, no water flowing. So you can have a tremendously high voltage, but no amperage. Amperage is about the electrons flowing. And that's an important link when we try to figure out why the current, if it's increased, will proportionally increase the amount of grams of that metal being collected there. Okay? All right, now, think about it carefully. Amperage is what? The Coulombs per time period, second. Let's make something up. So this is what we figured out. If, let's say the amperage was one, and that's 1.0 Coulombs for every second. Let's say he ran the experiment for 60 seconds. Okay, how many coulombs of charge ran through that circuit? If it's 60, if it's one coulomb per second and it ran for 60 seconds, there's 60 coulombs. Okay, and he measured the grams of iron that were collected as the result of the reduction that occurs at the cathode. Okay, then he had a different amperage, still coulombs per second, but now he used an amperage of 0.5 coulombs per second. But this time he ran it for two minutes. Wouldn't that give me the same coulombs if I ran this for a minute? A minute, right. So if you ran it twice as long, but have, okay, the amperage, you would have exactly the same amount of what? Current. And he got exactly the same number of grams. So his first law was about the mass of the deposit metal is directly proportionate to the quantity of electrical charge. So charge or quantity of charge we get from amperage. How much charge per second? So if I had 60 seconds of a one um, amp system or one coulomb per second um, amperage going through the circuit or going through the electrolytic cell, I'd make a certain amount of grams of iron and I'd make the same amount if I had an amperage that is half and I ran it twice as long the actual charge is the same. So in this case, both of these experiments would give me exactly the same grams of iron being produced. If I double the charge, I double the grams. That's what proportion, have it, I have it. So that was his first law. He could not calculate exactly how many grams of iron he's supposed to get, okay? But that was his first law. His second law, and this is really equally important, is that if I set this experiment up with exactly the same amount of amperage, okay, and I ran it for the same amount of time period, which means what? I'm giving the system the same amount of charge, correct? If I use the same time period and same amperage, I'm gonna get the same amount of coulombs, okay, and I choose different ions, different electrolytes, meaning different, instead of iron plus two, I'm gonna use, let's say, copper plus one. 
and we know that needs one electron to become copper zero. So if I did the same amount of charge, same amount of amperage and time period, or some combination of them, and I ran the same charge through two electrolytic cells, but one had copper plus one or one had iron, he didn't know copper plus one or iron plus two at the time. He knew that these guys had their individual equivalents. Okay, now what does that mean? Well, he knew that if I doubled the charge, this would increase. So if I doubled this, this would increase too. But he knew if I ran them under the same charge, they had a unique mass. They had a unique mass. Now stay with me for a second, okay? Look, now that we know about half reactions and electrons, and he didn't know anything about this, this stuff, electrons weren't discovered. Look at the half reactions here. Okay, for iron plus two, and again, he didn't know iron plus two existed. It was iron melted, okay? Isn't there twice the amount of electrons needed for each iron here? Yeah. So it makes sense that different amount of charge would produce different amounts of iron. Okay, that's important. Okay, but let's assume I had a metal that was the same as copper plus one. All right, let's assume I could make Na plus one gain an electron to become Na zero. This is important. Okay, if I add the same amount of charge, and the charge is due to the same amount of electrons delivered to the cathode, that's what we're talking about. When we say about amperage, we're saying, hey, how many electrons are delivered here? That's what this is amperage over time. So he said in the first law, if you have the same, if you have the same amount of electrons delivered, same charge, you're going to get the same amount of mass of the same chemical. If you double the amount of electrons, double the amp or the charge, you have double the grams. But now when I pick different compounds, I don't get the same value. I get a unique number. And let me help you with that. Let's look at the mass of um, sodium from the periodic table. And I don't know if it's too close or I'm too close, but oh, oh my gosh, that's so close. Let's back it up. So let's look at the mass of sodium. Okay, and it's over here. The atomic mass of sodium is 23. That's a relative mass. What does that mean? It's about 23 times heavier than the lightest element, which is hydrogen. Hydrogen gets a one, yes? So when you're doing the um, charge, you can just round it up? Yes, you can definitely round at this point. Uh -huh. Some people say keep it, but at this point you can round that. But what we're gonna say is essentially, this is called a relative atomic mass. Someone figured out, and we'll talk about the experiment that did that. I have to go forward to go backwards. Someone figured that sodium is 23 times heavier, one of their atoms, compared to hydrogen. So we give it a relative atomic mass. Now, someone found uh, copper to be 59 approximately. I'm sorry, it's cobalt, my bad. 64 should be, my bad. 64 for copper, I didn't feel right. So copper is about 64. So I'm gonna take this off because it's confusing. Okay, so they found in a separate experiment many years ago, we'll talk about that's called a mass spectrometer. But we found that copper, okay, is about 64 times greater than, or massive than hydrogen, and what? Sodium is about 23 times more massive. That means one copper atom is much bigger than a sodium atom. Well, I'm sorry, one atom of copper is a heck of a lot more heavier than one atom of sodium, correct? All right, cool. So what's that mean? If I produce the same number of electrodes, electrons at the cathode, what does that mean? If I deliver the same amperage in the same time period, and I deliver the same amount of coulombs in two separate experiments, one having iron, one having, uh, I'm sorry, one having copper, one having sodium, two separate experiments, I'm going to deliver the same number of electrons. Aren't I going to deliver and make the same number of atoms of pure metals? Yes, but they won't be the same mass because every individual atom has a unique mass, relative mass. So if I produce the same amount of atoms there, 
Which one's going to be heavier? The copper. The copper. I don't care how many atoms or how many of these are produced. Every one of these are produced one. I'm going to have a heavier amount. And he called that an equivalence. There is some equivalent value for copper that's different for sodium. Because why? You didn't know this yet. Okay? They were developing this in the 1800s. Individual atoms, particles of that element that's unique, have individual masses that are different. So if we have the same amount of them, this is going to be heavier. Same amount of these, this will be lighter. Okay? Now, we got to take this a step further. Okay? He, they also knew something about the valences. He knew iron would bond. Oh, he knew that copper, a lot of times, even though this is copper plus one I was dealing with, but he knew that certain metals like magnesium, Mg plus two, loves to bond with two chlorines. Now, they didn't know it was two chlorines, but they knew that there was chlorine with it. And here's what they do they take magnesium, they would add chlorine, they would collect the product. Then they would decompose the product, pull the chlorine off, and measure how much mass of chlorine is missing. They do the same thing with sodium, okay? I'm going to help you. They took magnesium. They reacted with chlorine. They didn't know it was chlorine, too. They just said they knew chlorine element. Mean, now, they didn't know it was MgCl2 was made. They just know you made magnesium and chlorine bonded together. It was a salt. What did they do? He heated it. And when he heated it, he drove off the chlorine. And knowing the, knowing the mass missing, he figured out the mass of chlorine. You with me? Good. Then he did something with like sodium, reacted with chlorine gas. Okay. And then it becomes sodium chloride, table salt. You don't know how many. Heat it and drive off the chlorine, the missing mass. That mass was lighter. So they figured out that there's valency. Different atoms can have ability to probably have more stuff bonded to it. So they knew that. That's why he says proportionate to the chemical equipment inverse proportion to its valency. What does that mean? Party people, for every two electrons in this half reaction, how many iron plus twos are made? One. Right. So this has a valency of two. So every two electrons, I make one. That's why it was divided by it's inversely proportionate, meaning if I know, and we'll see this today, if I know how many electrons needs to make this, and it's a two to one ratio between electrons in here, okay, once I have total electrons, I'm gonna have to divide by its valency. He didn't know about electrons here. He didn't know my magnesium loses too. So that's where that comes from. It's not important that you get all of that, but let's move on. Last step. Okay, last step in the process is how do we actually, now Faraday couldn't do this. Remember Faraday's time, he could do the experiment, he could see there was a proportionate difference in terms of coulombs, which is really what? Flow of electrons. He could see that there was an equivalent value of different atoms given the same amount. So based on his work, he could never calculate how many grams of iron would be produced or aluminum like last night. So what do we need? Two things. Number one, what is that equivalent? And that's called mole concept. We're going to spend time on it, but I want to introduce it in class a little bit today. So let me talk about mole concept, okay? And we're going to spend a lot more time on it, but here's it in a nutshell, okay? We have found out that if I have two gases, okay, two different gases, Let's say this is argon and this is krypton. These are monoatomic particles, okay? So the bottom line is krypton is much heavier, okay, per atom, correct? So I'm gonna draw krypton as being bigger, this is small, okay? So here comes argon. And I'm just drawing a snapshot. Krypton is bigger. But here's what they found. They found that although this one might be bigger, it occupies the same space. If temperature, which is essentially thermal energy, okay, if temperature goes up, these guys go faster and they're going to bounce on their container walls and escape or explode. This is an expandable container, kind of like a balloon. We found that if we keep temperature constant, how fast they move, 
and we keep the pressure on them constant, all right, we know that if we have the same number of particles, we have the same volume. It's called Avogadro's hypothesis. And I'm gonna explain more how that really works later. But that's, this is the crux of the hypothesis. So, when I measure krypton and argon, okay, I want you to understand that krypton per particle, its equivalence is much higher. Why? Because its atom individually, okay, is a lot heavier than the individual atom of argon. It's a relative scale, okay? Now, what we're gonna do here is as um, because we know that once you have the same volume of two gases, we say that the volume is proportionate, okay, to the number of molecules, particles. Hey, if I double the volume of this box, I'm going to double the actual number of particles. If I have the volume under the same temperature and pressure, I have them. So the crux of this mole concept is based upon if I have two volumes, that are equal under the same temperature and pressure, they must have the same number of particles. Now, think, think with me for a second. It seems like it's implausible that something bigger would, have, would occupy the same space. And here's the reasoning. Here's a huge gas. I'm going to draw it in real life, right here. Okay? I'm going to draw a gas particle that's a thousand times bigger. Can you see it? Gas particles are infinitely small. So if you make them bigger, they don't take up any what? Greater space. My drawings are, are silly, showing how big a difference is. Bottom line is big molecules move what? Slower. But they impact the walls with a greater force once they hit them. These guys move faster, but each collision with the walls, okay, is less. So their force on the container walls to occupy a volume winds up being the same. You with me? Good. Now. Let's change these gases. Let's make this hydrogen, and let's make this oxygen. Now, we're gonna mass out this box. Guess what we get? A ratio. We get a ratio of one to 16. That means no matter what, if I have 100 liters of oxygen atoms and 100 liters of hydrogen atoms, I'll always get the oxygen being 16 times heavier than the Hydrogen. Why? Because each atom of oxygen is 16 times more massive. By the way, atomic mass of oxygen is 16. It's 16 times more massive than the lightest gas. You with me so far? Good. Now, here's a catch. We want to have an equivalent. Hey, we know that these guys have a certain amount, a certain equivalent. We want to be able to count. I need a way to count as chemists. So what we said was, we need to have some number we're gonna count. We can't count individual particles, but we can count a group of them. So we decided what that group would be, okay? And we called it a mole. Now stay with me. We figured out what would be the volume of space that oxygen exists so that its mass is equal to 16 grams exactly. And what volume of hydrogen would the same amount of particles occupy that would equal one gram if they're the same number of molecules? Well, we found that out to be 22.4 liters. That's what this box is here, all right? 22.4 liters. They picked the amount of particles that can, as a gas, that exist at STP conditions, standard temperature pressure, that can fit in this box to be one mole, okay? Why? Because at 22.4 liters, exactly, exactly the mass of oxygen is 16, which is the exact mass of its atomic mass. They made the atomic mass, which is a relative scale, to be the grams of all the particles of a gas that can exist in this container. They chose this size container because the mass of the gas, okay, exactly equals the ratio. If this was 1,000 liters and this was 1,000 liters, the oxygen atoms would be 16 times more massive, 16, but that's, that's 16 grams. So they said, well, let's make the volume so small that we can get 16 grams so that we can use whatever number of atoms in here to be the same as this guy. We'll call it a one, a value of one. And we know the grams would be its atomic mass. We made it happen, okay? So the equivalent for sodium 
for one box of sodium is 23 grams. The equivalent for copper is 64 grams. We called that equivalent a mole. We later found out, this is way after Faraday, okay? And there's that big number up there. 602-214-150-000-000-000-000-000-000-000. That's called, uh, called Avogadro's number. That's actually how many atoms, okay, of a particle can exist in the gas phase to fill this container at standard temperature and pressure. That's a mole. That's cumbersome. So we're going to use that as our counting piece. When I say I have one mole, it's that many. I don't want to use that many, so I use a what? A condensed version. Hey, I got a dozen eggs. That's the condensed version of 12. So because these things are so small, to deal with a lot of them, to deal with a small amount means you're going to deal with a lot of them, we use the mole. So that's the equivalent, okay? So let's go to the problem here, okay? The back side. And we're going to run into this. And so to convert this quantity of charge into iron, I know that there's twice the moles of electrons as twice the moles of what? Iron. To get a mole of iron, I just look at the periodic table for the atomic mass, because we made a mole equal to those number of atoms of that. Okay? So let's go to this problem, and we'll see that. Okay, so here's the problem here. In electrochemical cell, a current of 0.25 amperes is passed through a solution of a sodium of a chloride of iron. Ooh, chloride of iron. We don't know what kind of iron that is. Okay, ooh, now you can't see what I'm doing here, so I gotta put this up. Bad grouse can get pizza. Here we go. I'm still here. Okay, here we go. So, there's two types of chloride ions. There's FeCl2 and there's FeCl3. How do I know? Well, there's two different types of irons. In your reference tables, and you don't have to memorize this, in your reference tables, we look at iron. Where are you? Oh, over here. I'll get there. Iron likes to become plus two or plus three. I know chlorine's negative one, for, so we don't know which one we have. So this the whole point of this problem is to get an unknown. Okay? So let's set up the experiment. An electrolytic cell. Okay, so we start with a battery. I don't know why that line's getting in my way, but hey, I can use it. Oh, it disappeared now. Negative is my anode of my battery. Positive here is my cathode. I'm going to have a beaker or some kind of container. I'm going to have the molten iron chloride. Now, I don't know which one I have. So it's Fe plus with a question mark. I do know this. It's Cl negative 1. Okay, I'm going to use an inert electrode that's not going to undergo oxidation or reduction. Could be platinum. And then I'm going to connect it with a wire. Now what do I know? Well, I do know that this anode is negatively charged. It's going to make this guy negatively charged because we're going to pump electrons to it. And electrons always flow from the anode to the cathode. What else do I know? Well, if this is positive here, it's going to make this guy positive. Now why? because electrons are going to be pulled to the cathode, which means this must be the anode. Electrons go from anode to cathode. What else is going to occur? Hey, the negative ion is going to be attracted to this place where there's a loss of electrons that's positive, and it's the anode, so oxidation occurs. Understanding this diagram makes this question come up that's real easy now. Write the equation for the, re the, the reaction that occurs at the, at the anode. Well, the anode is positive. Cl negative is going to be attracted to it, and the anode, like all anodes, is the place of oxidation, anox. So the chloride ion is going to oxidize into its pure form, which is chlorine. 
it's going to give off an electron and become Cl0. See, in electrolysis, people, what we're doing is making the pure forms. We're going to make pure chlorine here and make pure iron here. It's a purification type of reaction. Now, in truth, we should know that chlorine is part of those elements that are diatomic. We call them the Hofbrinkles. H-O-F-B-R-I-N-C-L-S. These guys love to bond with themselves. So those are my, I call them the Hofbrinkles. They're diatomic. Chlorine is one of the diatomic elements that love to bond. So if I say chlorine, it's gonna be Cl2, which means I need two chloride ions and two electrons. That is the correct half reaction. Notice it's oxidation. Notice the negative chloride ion goes to the positive anode, electrolytic cell, and what do we produce? The pure elemental state. That's what we do, we purify that. And that's that answer there. Okay, here comes the next question. When the cell operates for two hours, that is exactly how many grams of iron is produced here. Obviously the iron is the positive metal it's going to be attracted to the negative cathode because electrons are pumped there. And of course, we know what happens at the cathode. There is what? Red cat, reduction. One of two things are going to happen. It's either Fe plus 2 gains two electrons to become pure iron, or it's going to be Fe plus 3 gains three electrons to be iron. It's one of those two possibilities. The whole point of this problem is to figure out which one we have, right? So the clue is in the numbers. They said we ran the experiment for 0.25 amp amperes. Now, before we start using that calculation, okay, let's look what they gave me. They gave me point. Five, two, one grams of iron. Grams are not really going to help me. Just like it didn't help Faraday when he found, like, hey, they have a unique number that's developing. I want to convert that to moles. What's a mole? It's a number that tells me how many. It, the mole concept is a how many. Now, I know that one mole equals 6.02 times 10 to the 23, a huge number that I have written up there. I know it's a huge number. And it's too cumbersome to use that. So we're gonna use the word mole to condense that big number into an equivalent. Just like a dozen is 12, we say dozen. I have one dozen that represents 12. I say one mole, it's 6.02 times 1023, but it still represents some number of atoms, okay? Equal number of coppers and sodium. When I have one mole of copper and I have equal number, and I have that what? If I have a box of copper gas atoms, it's going to weigh 64 grams. When I have a what? A box of sodium at in the gas phase, it's 23. Same number of atoms, but because they're what? Have different what? Because they have different unique masses of their atoms, that's why they have different equivalents. So I'm going to convert this to moles. I'm going to convert this to a how many number. So I'll explain why it helps. Everything in chemistry is about a how many number, and that's where we're headed eventually. We're going to get grams, and I'm going to find a mole. Now, one mole equals how many grams? Well, party people, you go to reference tables. What value did we decide would be the equivalent mass of one mole of an atom? Why did we choose 22.4 liters? Why did we choose this arbitrary volume to be the equivalent of those particles in the gas phase, the number of particles would equal that one mole? We chose this because this size volume, the number of particles that fit in this 22.4 liters, gives me the mass equal to its atomic mass. We made an equivalent we can count equal to its atomic mass. So. Let's go to iron. What is its equivalent in one mole? 55.8. We'll use in round 56. What's that mean? 
if I have a box of iron gaseous atoms, tough to do, it would weigh approximately 56, gram, 56 grams. So one mole of iron, which represents that huge number, is 56 grams. That was the equivalent, okay, for copper at 64, sodium 23, that was the equivalent thing that Faraday was kind of implying. Notice my conversions, I'm getting rid of grams. Let's go find this number. Okay, so I take 0.521 and divide it by 56. And what do I get? 0 0.0093 moles of Fe. What does that represent? What does that represent? This gives me a good value for how many of these iron atoms were made. We have the grams. Here is its equivalent based upon a certain number of particles. So this is giving me a value of how many. Chemistry is about how many and the ratios. How do I know? What's the ratio between here and here? Two to one. I want to use that ratio to make the connection here. Okay, now I'm going to keep that to the side. Now we're going to use the information from electrolytic cell. We have what? The amperage, which we know is what? Coulombs per second. And we have what? Total time. So let's figure out how much coulombs and electrons are passing around. So let's do that. We're going to start with time, just like your homework. It'll take two hours. And by the way, we call this dimensional analysis. And the reason for it, it keeps you organized. If you set up a problem using your units, it's easier to set up and much, and it keeps you away from errors. If you're doing one step, writing the number down, then putting it in your calculator, do the next step, write it down, you're gonna make errors. Besides, if you're not using your units, you're also gonna forget steps. So I'm gonna convert hours into seconds. Why? Because what? Amps are in it. So here we take my hours. I put in the bottom, and I know that there's what? In an hour, there is 60 minutes. Look at my conversion. And I'm going to what? Cancel off hours. That's important. I want to convert my 60 minutes into seconds. And I know some people could have done this in their head. I want to get rid of minutes. So where do minutes go? Right. And for every one minute, there's 60 seconds. Now I'm get somewhere. I can convert the total seconds into total coulombs by using the amperage. In the problem, they said there was 0.25 amps. That's 0.25 coulombs of charge due to the electrons per second. That's what the amperage is. So my second goes bye-bye. And notice, this expression here was total seconds. And I don't care what the number is. I don't have to times this by two, times this, and write it down. It's there. What is this part here? Now that I multiply it by that factor, that right there is total coulombs. I don't care what that number is. I'm just letting it hang there. Now what do I do? Well, now I'm going to times it by Faraday's constant, fancy F. Faraday's constant, once we figured out what a mole was in terms of a how many number, someone figured out the amount of coulombs for a mole of electrons. So I'm gonna go from total charge to total number of electrons. So much, much later, way after Faraday, they called this constant after him for his work here, but he didn't know what a mole was. He didn't know what an electron was. We now know the charge is due to electrons, and we know exactly how many electrons gives me a certain what? Charge. That's what this ratio is. So Faraday's constant is um, 96,500 coulombs for every what? One mole of electrons. What's a mole? It's a how many number? It's an equivalent. Okay, 
I'm gonna solve for that. I'm gonna get moles of electrons, see if you can follow my drift. Okay, so I'm gonna solve for that. So I take, listen, I didn't do any solving yet. What I'll do is take my two, times it by 60, times it by 60. I know I did this right because my units cancel. Okay, times it by 2.250. Divide by one if I want. Times one. Now divide by 96,500. And I made a mistake. Two times 60 times 60 times 0 0.250 divide by 96,500. And here's my value. I get. 0 0.019. You say, what is that? What did I solve for? Mole. Moles of electrons. What is a mole equal? A mole is a how many number, right? How many moles of iron do we have? So I got moles of electrons. Let's just rewrite this to make this nice and pretty. I got 0 0.019 moles of electrons that were pushed onto the cathode and utilized by all the iron plus, I'm not sure which one yet. And we had exactly from another calculation 0 0.0093 moles of iron actually being made. All right? So if you notice, this is almost 0 0.02, and this is almost 0 0.01. If you look at the ratio, okay, and these are experimental values, okay, you can see that this is a 2 to one ratio. And if you don't believe me, you take the 0 0.019 and divide it by the 0 0.0093 and you will get the 2.04. So this divide by here is a two to one ratio. And so what does that tell me? Well, if I have twice the number of electrons than iron, do we know which half reaction we're dealing with? Yeah, we now have these ratios. So we have two moles of electrons to one mole of iron. Does that sound interesting? Two electrons, two equivalent of electrons to one iron Gave me iron zero. What charge, what charge must this iron be? Of course, it's plus two. And therefore, the what? The salt that was produced was iron chloride, or that was the salt that was used in this experiment. Because we got a two to one ratio. All right, and again, these ratios of how many are centered around these equivalents that Faraday identified but didn't know quite what they were. Now we know what they are. These equivalents are equal number of atoms but have a unique mass or a unique molar mass or formula mass, or in this case, atomic mass. Every atom has a unique mass. Equal number of those atoms will have their own unique grams for one mole. We made this equivalent that we count, three to one ratios, we made a mole concept to be able to use those ratios. And with that ratio, we were able to identify analytically that the salt used that was actually melted in this electrolysis experiment had to be iron chloride. So we used redox to actually identify what? What the unknown chemical was, all right? So that's pretty cool.